ahead and get started. Welcome to our session entitled uh, Scaling Effective Causes, Cash Transfers. Before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I just want to remind you that as with almost all the sessions at the conference, there will be a Q&A after that we invite you to contribute to. So um, pull out your Swap Card app, and you can pull up this event and click on the live discussion button. Um, and you can go to the question tab and either add a question yourself or just upvote questions that other people have left. Um, when we get to the Q&A portion, I'm sure you guys will have much better questions than me, so I'll draw from the ones that are most upvoted there. Um, and please also make sure that those cell phones are silenced while you have them out. Thank you. Um, all right, our speaker today is Michael Kayemba. Um, Michael leads innovation at the nonprofit Give Directly, which you guys will hear all about in just a sec. Um, he was previously the country director for Give Directly in Uganda, and before that, he worked in management consulting here in the US, specializing in healthcare and in government social protection programs. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, this is a very intimate environment, which I think I, I prefer. I know it's, it's the late evening. You folks have been uh, moving around to a lot of very interesting sessions in the day, so I hope I can still capture your, your attention. And therefore, I'll, I'll be a bit more interactive throughout the, the couple of minutes that, we are, that I'm going to share with you a couple of things about Give Directly. So first, I will have a couple of questions throughout, just to make sure Nobody dozes off, not that that's a, a, a big concern. But who here knows about Give Directly by show of hands? Okay, this is a friendly crowd. Um, who here is skeptical about cash transfers? Yes, I'll see you in office hours right after this. Um, so, who is Give Directly? Give Directly is an international nonprofit that does cash transfers, right? We send people cash all over the world in about 11 countries, no strings attached, right? And we've been doing this for the last, uh, for the last about 10 years. And during that time, we've been able to raise nearly a billion dollars. We are in 11 countries, including the US. We've reached approximately 1.2 a million people, and I know everybody here cares about impact and research, so we've wonderfully done about 19 RCTs, right? And there are a bunch of people that think we are doing a lot of good work, so they are, they are supporting us. So why, why cash transfers, right? As some of you in this room might know, cash transfers are probably the most widely studied and researched poverty alleviation um, approach and measure, right? There are over 300 studies that have been done about cash transfers in a number of countries, in a number of contexts, in a number of populations, right? And some of that research has been done by Give Directly, but the vast majority has not been done by, by Give Directly. And basically, what the research shows are three different things. One, that cash transfers significantly improve positive outcomes, right? Two, they decrease negative outcomes. And three, people don't just drink the, the money, right? So the, the money is not spent on, on booze, on, on alcohol or cigarettes or other things that are called temptation goods, right? So, in, in terms of positive outcomes, you, we see the usual suspects, right? That uh, people get increased assets, I income from businesses increases, um, food expenditure, school attendance, and all those nice things that we like to see. And then decrease in negative outcomes that IPV uh, decreases, you know, domestic partner violence, child labor decreases, and there is no evidence that spending on temptation goods as well um, increases as a result of people give, being given cash. So how does Give Directly do this, right? We are control freaks, unfortunately, that we like to handle every part of the delivery process. But that is with good reason, right? Because we think that by doing that, it enables us to better maintain good program integrity 
and also enables us to move significantly faster than if those steps were carried out by different people, right? All different organizations. So we start all the way from the program design and conception. So what should this program be like? Who should, who should we target as a part of this? Um, how much money should they receive and why? To enrollment, where we are saying, okay, we know that this program is targeting urban youth in Kenya. That is the targeting piece. But how do we get them to know about the program and participate into the program? And then the audit function is saying, of all the people that we've enrolled, can we confirm that they are in fact the right people that we intended to enroll? And then the number five, which is uh, covered at the moment is the transfer. So that is the active act of sending them money. And the primary methodology we use, the primary delivery vehicle that we use for that is uh, mobile phone, um, mobile money. Uh, M-Pesa is, I think, the most commonly known. Um, and then we monitoring and evaluation. And then number seven is usually the, the research components sometimes. So that is the process that we follow to sort of get to delivering cash transfers. And again, I would be amiss at an EA conference not to show this slide that shows how effective, rather how efficient, cash, our approach to delivering cash transfers is, right? So for all of you today that are going to donate to give directly, um, you can be sure that 90 cents of every dollar you're going to give us makes it to the direct beneficiary in one of the 11 countries in which, uh, in which we operate. So th that's the quick and dirty about Give Directly, the, the why and the what uh, in terms of what we, what we do. So I have a couple additional questions for you all here. Um, who can tell me right now how many people live in extreme poverty globally? Just a couple of guesses. You can just stand up and shout out the guess. Sorry? 500 million? Close. 800 million. 800 million. Close. Yes? A billion? No. <laughs> Not yet. Hopefully we won't get there. One more? Yes. Ooh, please clap for him. <laughs> 674 million people are living in poverty, right? Could somebody tell me what the theoretical number for getting those 700 people out of poverty is? Or what, what does somebody think it would take to take 700 million people out of poverty? Just imagine you're Elon Musk and you can write a check right now and you wanted to end global poverty. How much do you think it would cost you? $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Too much. It's, it's a much smaller problem. Any, yes? Wait, $10 billion? No, sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry? 800 billion, the, the number is about 200 billion, right? Uh, the Brookings Institute puts it at about 100, 100 billion dollars, but I think when you add on the cost of delivery of that cash, like the fact that I think the programs might need to go on for a longer period of time, like the actual estimate for implementation is about 200 billion dollars. Who can tell me the size of the largest NGO globally? How big do you think the largest NGO in the world is by, from, by revenue terms? Just a wild guess. I'm curious. 100 million. Multiply that by, it's a billion. It's about a billion dollars, right? So the largest NGO at the moment in the world is able to, its programs cost about a billion dollars, right? And those programs are a mixture of uh, both poverty alleviation, crisis response, right? But the reason I'm, I'm saying that 
is that the scale of the problem that we are dealing with, right? Give directly, we are very happy that we've been able to basically reach about 1.2 million people living in poverty at the moment. But the problem is what? Almost 700 million people, right? We are congratulating ourselves about having raised about a billion dollars in 12 years of operations, but the scale of the problem is $200 billion worth, right? The largest NGO is about a billion dollars, but the scale of the problem is about $200 billion, right? So, and, and that's the graph here, right? That to the, to the far left, that is give directly, barely recognizable, right? To the right of that is the largest NGO in the world at the moment, right? And then to the far right, that is the scale of the problem, right, that we are trying to solve, right? So for us to be able to attempt to even begin tackling this problem, while Give Directly has been very successful in a lot of work that we've done, it, it's just not enough, right? It's just, it's just not enough. So to be able to do this better and do it um, long term, we need to do three things, right? We need scale, ultra scale, we need speed, and we need accuracy, right? Why scale? The problem is big, right? 700 million people are living in poverty, right? Um, why does speed matter? Is because for majority of these people, the, the need is immediate. For a number of these people, they cannot feed their families. For a number of these people are in a crisis situation, right? So speed is of, is of, is of um, uh, is, is incredibly important in tackling this problem. And then the third is accuracy, right? At the moment, there is, uh, with the fears of a global slowdown and recession, you cannot afford to have a lot of waste in the programs that you're having. Otherwise, donor fatigue will sort of kick in because people are like, no, I can't, I'm not sure my money is going to the right causes or to the right people, right? So those three things are incredibly, are incredibly important. And what are the bottlenecks to achieving speed, um, scale, and accuracy in the, in the NGO world, right? So if you talk to anybody that, that operates in the nonprofit sector, I would say they will tell you that part of their biggest problem is not fundraising necessarily. It is a problem, but it's not the biggest problem. But one of the biggest problems for people operating in NGO world is actually finding the right people and enrolling them. That is one of the biggest problems that people working in this sector face, right? And that is one of the, that is one of the bottlenecks. Those two are some of the bottlenecks to sort of scaling the impact that, that cash can have uh, in trying to attempt to um, accelerate the end, of, the end of poverty. So what can be done about this? First of all, what, what is good targeting in the context of uh, a poverty alleviation project? Of course, it's including poor people, excluding unpoor people, um, um, doing that efficiently in a way that is fraud resistant, right? So th that brings me to, I think, the, the, the core part of what I wanted to discuss today, which is how can we use technology to help us with this scale, speed, and accuracy sort of bottleneck to scaling what is otherwise widely agreed as a successful intervention, cash transfers, right? Remember, the problem is $200 billion. Give directly, Berlin is noticed on that blip. The largest NGO barely is making an effort um, compared to the problem. So we need to utilize technology to, if we have a chance at sort of um, moving faster. And, and I'll share with you a story that I think brought this to, um, to, the, to the fore. During COVID, how many of you stayed at home for an extended period of time? 
everybody. How many of you had access to milk, bread, croissants, pizza? Good. So during the pandemic, um, I'm a young dad. I have a two-year-old now. So during the pandemic, I needed a movement permit in order to go to the market to find food, right? Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to even have the money to be able to go to the market to find food, right? But for a, in a number of these countries, what they did, the, the best preventive measure that a lot of low-income countries utilize to deal with, with COVID was locking down the entire population to prevent spread, because that was the cheapest, because vaccines were not as widely spread, there was some hoarding happening in some parts of the world. But anyway, the, the best intervention was step put in place, help will come your way, hopefully, right? And in this context of fear, it was extremely difficult to get food or any other supplies to people in a number of these countries, right? And in Togo in particular, where we worked, um, the government needed to, to, the government was dealing with two problems, right? One, we've dispersed everybody there in their homes. Some people went to their villages, right? And the first question was, on a nationwide scale, how can we find where the poor people are located at the moment that are sheltering in place, right? Um, why? Because such countries do not have the luxury of maintaining very expensive social protection databases, right? That was question number one. Where are the people that we need to give this support to? Question number one. Question number two was, even if we know where these people are, we don't have enough funds to give money to everybody. So who are the poorest and most vulnerable and how do we reach them and give them the support that they need as quickly as possible because speed is of the essence, because some of these people do not have savings, so otherwise they will starve and maybe the government will be overthrown, right? So how did we work with the government of Togo in trying to, to solve this issue? This is where I think AI first came in, where by, you, by using high-resolution satellite imagery, you're able to train an AI model to recognize topographical features, right? That the difference between a paved road and an unpaved road, that is a proxy for a slightly wealthier versus a less wealthy area, right? Um, whether there are whether there are things like hospitals or other points of interest, areas that are more likely to have those are less likely to be, um, um, are, are likely to be less affluent, right? And then the other is the roofing material, right? If, you're, if the roof you're using is either iron sheets or tiles versus grass thatched, those as well are able to tell the difference between an affluent neighborhood versus not, right? So, Millions of those images uh, were utilized to identify the poorest, let's think of them as counties, uh, if you're using the US setting, the poorest counties in, um, across the entire Togo. Um, so problem one was solved using um, AI models and, and sort of training them. And then the second question was, how do we identify the poorest people give in a in a world where we have limited resources to be able to find them. And I think that's where machine learning came in, right? Where, does everybody have a phone here? I'm assuming yes, I see a lot of nods, right? So your phone is a very good way of helping researchers understand your social economic status. So your cell phone usage behavior and patterns are very, very well correlated your level of affluency or poverty, right? And some of this research had already been going on prior to the pandemic. We had done a, couple, we had done a pilot in, in Uganda of this work, and COVID was just a good opportunity to test it further and also implement it at, at scale. So 
There were the two main questions answered. So the first one was, where do the poorest people live? And then the second one was, who are the poorest people within these geographies? And that's where the um, cell phone metadata um, came in. So how did the program work? So th the first part of it was, um, was sort of the identification of people. Where do they live? Who are they, right? And then once we found out that, um, um, for example, you are poor, according to your cell phone usage uh, patterns and data, your number was whitelisted within a government system to know that you're immediately eligible. And you who is more affluent, your number was not whitelisted, right? So there was already in the back end a whitelisted number of the poorest people. And then it was a question of self-enrollment of those people into, into the program using USSD. So you dial a number star 855 hash, you fill in some little demographic information about yourself that then is matched to the back end, and then boom, automatically you get um, a transfer that helped you to buy food, medicine, and all, other, and all other things, right? And this was amazing because it was a true collaboration and partnership. Right, between Give Directly, UC Berkeley, the Ministry of Digital uh, Economy in Togo, and our donors that helped fund this, fund this program. And, and we think that I think to end or attempt to end or reduce the gap of people that are living in poverty, such partnerships are going to be critical, right? Even the largest NGO in the world cannot do it alone. So partnerships are going to increasingly become extremely critical in sort of tackling this, this problem. So what were the results, right? Within a matter of weeks, we were able to send out transfers to about 140,000 people across the country. And I'll put that in perspective for you, because you may think 140,000 is, uh, that's not a lot, that's not millions. Yes, but in contrast, it took I was the country director for Uganda before um, leading the innovation team. It took us about three years to be able to reach the same number of people, right? So I think that puts it a little bit in perspective in terms of how groundbreaking that was um, in terms of um, acceleration of impact. So you may ask, Part of the reason I think Give Directly was slower previously in enrolling recipients is because we were being methodical and we were using a methodology that we knew that was tested and tried and good. So what claims can we make about um, the equivalency of methodology, right, between the previous one that took us three years to enroll uh, 140,000 people versus one that took us a matter of days or weeks to enroll the same number of people. And this is where UC Berkeley did research to try and, and figure this out. Now, this is the most complicated slide of the entire presentation. I'm sure we can get through it. So the way they measure the accuracy of uh, machine learning models is mainly by two criteria. One is called precision, the other is recall. Um, and the way to think about it is, if this is a, if, if this is Togo, right, this room is Togo, the people we are trying to target, we are trying to, find, we are trying to dissociate the poorest people from the more affluent people, right? So the ability of an ML model to detect many poor people out of a heterogeneous pool, that is precision, right? But remember, it will leave out some people that are poor by accident or just because the model is not as good, right? Now, uh, recall is the comparison between within the poor people in this room, how many did the model actually pick out versus how many did it leave out, right? That is the recall. So in comparison with those two, you can see that the cell phone metadata performed better than the other available options on both measures. Right? And the other available options were either um, trying to identify poor people by their occupation or by where they lived. The ML model performed better on both of those. Right? So it is scientifically a good methodology to utilize to test to target people. 
And then the second measure was around um, bias, right? And the bias was measured in two ways. One was bias according to gender, right? And the, uh, to the graph on the left, the line in the middle is a line of best fit. And it basically shows that because the line is passing through those, that box pretty much in the middle, that there was hardly any bias between either over testing for men or women in terms of the selection, right? That is a good thing that the model is performing well. And then to the, to the right, that was breaking down further by the different demographics within a population. So by ethnicity, right? You don't want a model that's going to be um, performing by either picking out uh, people of a certain ethnicity more than people of, a, of another ethnicity. And we also saw that the model performed quite well on those as well, on those measures too. And I think as a result, this work was recognized early this year in Nature as a groundbreaking way of targeting people living in poverty, right? So where do we go from here? So we know the problem is large, just to go back. Uh, the problem is large, the need is urgent, um, and, the, and the accuracy is important. And now there is a model that I think checks off all those boxes. And now we feel that as Give Directly, we stand a chance of not being insignificant on the um, journey to reducing that $200 billion problem, but actually now we have a shot at accelerating our ability to have impact uh, because, of, because of this work. So what have we done since, since Togo? We've sort of gone ahead and done uh, additional proofs of concepts in a number of countries. So we've done uh, an additional project in DRC, and this year and through next year, we are looking to do more sort of scale-up projects in, uh, in a couple of more, of more countries. So we are doing one in Malawi at the moment. We'd like to do another one in, hopefully, in Uganda, Kenya, and Mozambique. And with this work, we hope to transform how cash is delivered globally, not just by us, but by other actors as well within the sector. So be it governments, because governments are usually the largest social protection um, um, deliverers anyway, right? Or other NGOs that are interested in identifying people better and therefore being better able to transfer cash to them, right? We think this has a, a significant role to, pray, to play. And we think of that in sort of three particular buckets, right? There is, I think, cash for humanitarian, so in terms of crisis, right? The example I gave, COVID, lockdown, or uh, uh, for example, in Pakistan, where we are having huge floods, right? Or um, in Mozambique, that's very much battered by cyclones year over year, right? How do you give people anticipatory action type transfers so that they, there is harm reduction prior to a flood happening, right? We think this model can work very well with those humanitarian responses. And then the large-scale poverty alleviation sort of program, like Give Directly does in a number of our countries. And, and finally is within technical assistance and social protection for governments, right? So those are the three buckets where we think um, this approach could be significantly utilized to further scale um, um, the impact uh, that cash can have. Um, and I think th 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 this is the final slide in terms of like having this, uh, setting up this infrastructure takes time, right? It could take anywhere between um, 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 three to nine months, depending on the context, to be able to set up this necessary infrastructure in a country, right? I'm sure some of you are thinking, yes, if you can find out how poor I am, how, how, how won't you find out my location and how do you prevent bad actors from doing harm to me, right? And all those are valid questions. So I think in setting up this infrastructure, those are questions that need to be front and center. How do we ensure privacy, right, of the, of the people? How do we ensure informed consent, right, that somebody knows that their data is in fact being 
utilized, but for what purpose and by whom and for how long, right? And is there sort of a governance mechanism that involves government and regulators and ethicists that are able to regulate this usage, right? Um, so yeah, I think those are some of the other questions we are still sort of in the process of figuring out as we continue scaling, but they are not lost to us that I think there are risks to this approach, but I think there are risks that we think can be mitigated if we are thoughtful about them. Um, uh, I'm being given a five minute warning, but I'm actually done. Um, so thank you very much. That's the end of the prepared remarks. I think the final thing I wanted to share with you is um, how you can get involved with Give Directly. One, please donate, right? We have lots of programs, and now we can actually handle a billion dollars or more. So if you want to give us a billion dollars, please give it to us. We'll be able to send it out very, very quickly. We have what it takes to do that. But if you cannot donate to us, then come work with us, right? We have lots of open roles at the moment um, in various parts of the organization where you can truly have um, impact within the, within the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a reminder that we'd love to hear your questions, so please do open up Swapcard, click on that live discussion button, and submit whatever questions you want uh, in the questions tab, or upvote the ones that you want to see asked, uh, and I will forward them along to our expert here. Um, I wanted to start, Michael, by just asking, you know, most of us in this room have the good fortune of having been born and are raised in relatively wealthy countries, and so uh, these areas that Give Directly is targeting are kind of inherently unfamiliar. Um, can you just paint a picture for us of what like the typical Give Directly recipient's life is like? I know, you know from your slides that there's no single occupation that can predict things uh, better than you know, cell phone data, and so there's not one archetype, obviously. But, um, but yeah, what, what's sort of a, a, a story that can illustrate what people are actually struggling with at this level of poverty and what they might spend a cash transfer on? Yeah. That's a great question, and also a difficult question, I'll, I'll admit. Um, I'm going to turn to, the, to, to get support from the, from the audience. Who here has been to a low-income country? Oh, everybody. This is a, it's an amazing crowd, so they can answer the question for you. Wow, great. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I think... Uh, People living in, in poverty have a lot of things on their mind, right? I think there is, um, will I afford my meal tomorrow, right? Questions. If my child falls sick, um, when, will they be able to get access to medical care, and if they can, am I able to afford to be able to do that for them and, and purchase that sort of service for them? Then there is a the question of school, right? Um, are there schools that are good? Even if there are, can I afford to be able to take my child there? Right, so I would say people living in poverty have a myriad, I think, of of needs and sort of issues that they are always thinking about and juggling every single time. And therefore, it makes it extremely difficult, I think, for anybody to think that they can decide for them which of those myriad calculations, micro calculations they are making every day is the best way to help them, right? And I think that's what makes cash really good, that I think once you put cash in their hands, then they are better able to make those deductions in terms of, okay, this is the most urgent thing now, then this is the most urgent, then that is the most urgent, then that is the most urgent, right? So I guess it's, it's actually not surprising, given that, that research does not find that people actually spend the money frivolously. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, everyone's the expert on their own situation. Exactly. Um, so I guess 
that leads into a question that we have from, from Greer in the audience, who's wondering, how do you actually track the goods and services on which GD recipients spend their money? Um, you know, we have this information that there's no evidence about increasing temptation goods, um, but they're wondering if this is self-reported, you know, how reliable is that information? Um, and relatedly, at what level of income would you expect that they would start to spend on temptation goods, for example? Yeah. Who here every so often drinks a beer or wine or a shot of tequila, which is my favorite? OK, everybody, <laughs> right? So is it wrong for somebody to have a shot of tequila, right? If it's not wrong for you or me, why is one beer so terrible for somebody living in poverty, right? So I think that is the opening premise, right? That Our, one is there is no evidence that people do spend the money increasing, that, that people spend the marginal dollars they receive on temptation goods. That evidence does not exist, right? Um, but to answer the first question on in terms of how do we track, two ways, right? Part of it is uh, we have our cities, so we've done 19 our cities internally as give directly, where we actually follow up and measure exactly what people spend the money on. We do sort of a pre and post um, analysis of what people spend their, uh, the money they receive from give directly on, and that is more of a robust scientific um, analysis that can be sort of relied upon. Um, and then the second way is self-reported. I think that's, that was part of the, of the issue that was being raised. The second way is definitely self-reported. But we do have um, field officers that either call the recipients or go, at, or go door to door to find out that if you said you spent some of the money on uh, livestock, can we see the livestock, right? And in most of these, and in uh, the vast majority of the cases, we do find that I think the things that recipients report spending on, we don't usually have to ask for the evidence. They usually volunteer it themselves because they feel so proud about having ticked off that long item that they've always wanted to do, be it buying more livestock or sending their child through university, right? They're always proud to share the successes that have been able to get um, out of this. And why wouldn't they be? That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm actually curious. I, I know that with development aid more broadly, um, one of the critiques you often hear is that there are these unintended downstream consequences. You know, so for example, if you, you know, flood uh, a village with free shoes, then you sort of crowded out the, the man in that village who made his living selling shoes to that yeah. population. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing this tracking, does give directly, like where do you sort of draw the line on what secondary or even tertiary effects you're trying to measure? Do you try to think about things like how does this affect the local economy or mm -hmm. is there any kind of like inflation dynamic or, mm -hmm. or is that just mm -hmm. sort of you know, beyond the scope of what give directly is trying to measure? Ah, good question. Yeah. So, I think the beauty of cash is actually does stimulate markets, right? It actually increases uh, commerce within, within these areas where we work. And actually there is a study we did in, um, in Kenya in CIA County that found that, and we were looking to, to find sort of general equilibri equilibrium effects of cash to people that don't receive it, right? So for people that receive cash, there is a lot of evidence that's out there in terms of what, how that cash is beneficial to them. But the question was, what are the secondary positive externalities that happen within the economy for people that do not receive the cash, right? And the study in Kenya found a 2.4 uh, X multiplier within the economy of the $1 that was given, right? So I think that that is one way we've done a rigorous study. But in terms of like preventing harm, in terms of um, inflationary pressures and all of that, we do monitor, right? We do monitor inf inflation, but also we send out the cash in phases mm. specifically to make sure that it does not cause inflationary pressure, usually in the smaller settings in which people are. So for the large cash transfer programs where we give $1,000 to 
uh, to a household, we do not give them $1,000 all at once. We give it in three phases usually, and that also helps with sort of uh, preventing inflationary pressures. That makes sense. Yeah. Is that something that you guys have experimented with, sort of trying one lump sum versus three versus 12 and arrived at this, this ideal number, or is it still sort of an open question? Ah, good question. So th that is what we've traditionally done, but actually now we are getting ready to give recipients even more choice mm -hmm. because we've done some preliminary sort of focus group discussions where our recipients are actually saying we want to receive the money differently. Right? And therefore, we are listening to them. And I think we are going to create even more choice. So I'm not sure what it's going to be moving forward. It could be that I think for some people, it's fewer. For some people, it's more. Um, I think that is still TBD. Cool. Yeah. We we'll look forward to seeing what, what happens there. Uh, another question from the audience. You talked about the pretty in incredible accuracy of this algorithm for finding the poor um, who, who should be targeted for this intervention. But the number was not 100%. Um, so Anupama is wondering, what were the limitations to that accuracy? And is it possible that combining phone targeting data with other methods could be even more effective to reach even more people? Yeah. So. I'll admit I'm not an AI software engineer, right? So I'm going to answer this, I think, a bit more broadly. But I think with any new methodology, right, the part of the question is statistical significance, right? Is there statistical significance enough that this is good to start with, right? And I think that is what the uh, the strong um, um, recommendation from Nature was saying that, yes, this is good, this has impact, this should be further studied and expanded upon, right? But I think there is still a lot more work to do to sort of get the model better and smarter and uh, um, as close as, as to increase the sort of precision and recall of the model, I think, there's still a lot more to do, but I think is the model currently able to be used within um, um, a population and will it be significantly better than the available methodology for test for targeting people at the moment? Yes. Um, yeah. As a quick follow-up to that, um, you mentioned mobile payments being the majority of the mechanism that you use. Uh, do most people in these targeted areas have a mobile phone? Is there, is there like a tranche of yeah. the global poor that might be missed by that methodology? Yeah, absolutely. So look, um, the, the biggest sort of drawback of this model is it assumes that poor people have cell phones, right? And it is true that cell phone penetration is skyrocketing in a lot of these countries where we are operating, right? And we are not saying that this model needs to completely replace existing methodology. No, we are saying this model, as cell phone penetration increases, we should not wait for cell phone penetration to be at 100% before we start innovating, right? This model can add on to other existing models to significantly accelerate the rate at which poor people can be found and targeted and help given to them as the cell phone penetration catches up. Now, what is Give Directly doing about increasing cell phone access and penetration in, in countries where we work? So for majority of our programs, we do actually offer recipients cell phones um, as well as uh, digital financial literacy as a part of our program. So even our programs alone are helping increase both digital financial literacy as well as cell phone penetration. Um, again, that's why if somebody has a billion dollars to give us, you will be increasing cell phone penetration. <laughs> that, that, was an, that was an ad, so I'm, I'm back to you. <laughs> Brief commercial break. Yeah, commercial um, break. That actually does transition into another question we have from the audience. So cell phones are an example of something that, you know, even to get a transfer in this way is a prerequisite. Yes. Once someone receives this money, it also does seem like, you know, cash is only as useful as the markets you have access to. Yes. And and so these transfers being uh, really impactful, 
you know, requires people being able to go out and get the goods and services that they need to solve the problems in their lives. Yeah. Um, so someone's wondering just, are there situations in which cash transfers might be inappropriate because those, those crucial markets don't yet exist in the particular uh, area? Or does GiveDirect actually think about you know, ways that they can partner with other organizations to, to sort of give access to those goods? Or does it seem like the, the limiting factor really is just mm -hmm. access to cash? Yeah, capitalism, baby. <laughs> so I would say, I say that to say that actually, what we've found is that the markets, even in small um, um, communities, are actually extremely responsive to the needs. Right? So we find that, for example, in a community where the biggest sort of need is housing, right? all of a sudden, from nowhere, busloads of sand and iron sheets and cement begin coming into the, into the area without us prompting that. right? because the need is there now, people have the capital to be able to do it, the market seems to solve that sort of supply problem on its own, right? But, but I think the question that, uh, who asked the question? Uh, this is from, forgive me if I say your name wrong, uh, Iceland. Isla? Iceland, I'm so sorry. Iceland. If you're here, yeah. please say it the right way. So I think, the, the, <laughs> Ashley. All right, uh, but I think so that the question that Ajli has not asked, but I do want to respond to is, are there public goods that the, 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 the way that we give cash is not able to address? And the answer is yes, right? So cash is not going to solve the poor road that's, that's leading into a village, right? And that's why we say that I think increasingly operating at scale, partnerships with governments and with other players that are able to provide some of these public goods is important to sort of further, um, sort of accelerate the, 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 the power of cash. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, speaking of the power of cash, uh, Corinna is wondering if cash transfers bring people out of poverty permanently or is there, a limited duration for which these transfers are done um, as, an, as, a, as a welfare transfer? Is this yeah. indefinite, the benefit? Or? Yeah. Karina, great question. So cash transfers do bring people out of poverty. Again, who knows the, the measure of extreme poverty now? What's the measure of extreme poverty? Yes. Somebody else? Sorry? Somebody else? Sorry? Yes? Ah. Pranathi? 215, right? So it's recently been updated, right? So again, you're not wrong, the, 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 the measure of, um, of extreme poverty has been for a very long time a dollar ninety, right? But because the measure itself has gone up, it means people that were successfully living on a dollar ninety are now considered poor, mm -hmm. right? So I think, will people sort of fall in and out of poverty every so often? Yes, and that is expected. Right? And how do we think about the role of uh, an NGO versus government versus other people in sort of um, putting people out of poverty or providing for their needs? Right? I don't think it should be the role of an NGO to do social protection. Right? In the US, there are lots of social protection programs. Right? Medicaid, Medicare, TANF, SNAP, multiple programs. And I think there is a role for government programs to play for sort of the, the most vulnerable of us within society, right? And I don't think that many NGOs would be able to successfully be able to maintain that level of social protection, right? So we think there are people that will either fall in and out of poverty and will need social protection, right? I think that's the baseline understanding. And then there are going to be people that are not sort of in the, in the extreme vulnerability category, but are above that, right? And we think that is where the power of cash really is in terms of bringing those people 
out of poverty over a very extended period of time. And right now, the, the most long-term study that there is around bringing people out of poverty using cash transfers is about 10 years, right? That giving a one-time cash transfer was able to help people remain out of poverty and have better indicators than, than people that did not receive cash transfers for over 10 years. That's a full decade, right? Now, is that permanent? Not necessarily, but again, what is the counterfactual as well, right? So, because again, th this is a relative comparison, right? Could somebody as well show me a study where they are saying that over 10 years, giving somebody a cow got them out of poverty for more than 10 years or less than 10 years, right? So I think that is the piece, that cash has been studied long enough that I'm even able to give an answer of 10 years. For a lot of other interventions, that answer simply doesn't exist, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, and for people in this room who are caring a lot about measurability, I think like the, the ability to just point very concretely to where the money's going and what its effect is, is, is really amazing yeah. in terms of what GiveDirect does. By the way, that, that 215, that's purchasing power equivalent, right? So yes. I remember when I first heard that, you know, a part of my brain was like, oh yeah, but you know, the US dollar goes a long way in some of these other countries, but it's, it's nothing to do with an actual amount of dollars in your hand. It's yes. like what I can imagine buying for myself here for $2 is what that person would be able to buy. It's, it's just mind blowing to think about trying to survive with that, that amount of resources. Um, all right, uh, Isaac is wondering, what types of non-cash interventions are you most optimistic about? Specifically, those things which may be unavailable for recipients to purchase themselves. So this is going on with this theme that we know. It's, it's one piece of the puzzle, but are there other things out there that you're excited to see more of? Yeah, I would have to say, I think it would have to do with the public goods mm -hmm. that I think make um, the impact that, that sort of magnify and improve the the impact of cash transfers, and I think those are the um, um, the the avenue of governments, right? And again, there are a number of things like give well that has rated deworming, immunization, mosquito nets, and all those. I think those are those are there, um, and I think they are eff effective and impactful and. Um, um, are needed and necessary, and I think there are a lot of people doing those. But I would say, um, likewise, a number of public goods being more available would amplify the, um, the impact of cash. Yeah, makes sense. So I guess, you know, on this theme of trying to, to amplify or complement the impact of cash, um, you know, conditions on the ground are obviously going to vary a lot from, from place to place. Uh, but we have a question from the audience. Uh, from Andrew, who's, who's wondering, how do you approach concerns that in some, especially like particularly poor areas, government institutions may be corrupt, authoritarian, violating human rights? Um, is there a risk that organizations which do partner with those kind of government institutions would legitimize or, or even enrich or strengthen regimes that are harmful or oppressive? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, And the, the part of the way to answer that is um, sharing, I think, one of the mistakes that Give directly made in, over the last, I would say, maybe seven years, right, of our existence, right? I think going off of the premise that that is not untrue that some governments are corrupt, that uh, some governments are authoritarian and whatnot, um, give directly for a long time, we operated in silos, right? And I think it made sense at the time to operate in silos because of the scale we were operating at, right? We were operating at a very, very tiny scale of 50,000 households over three years, right? That, that is a tiny scale on a, on a nationwide scale. So I think not partnering with governments um, in that sort of uh, scale, I think is probably the best way to go. And it has no, um, uh, 
significant side effects. But I think when you're looking to operate at massive scales, governments are critical, right? Because I think the infrastructure that is necessary to reach those massive scales is, is imbued within some of those structures, right? That's one. Two, if you do not at the very least play nice with governments, and that does not mean bribing, that means sharing with them this is the program we are doing, this is why we are doing it, this is why it matters. Remember, they also have constituents that vote them in, right? Whether rigged to some extent or not, they are voted in. So they do care about their opinions and um, the livelihoods of their people, right? So knowing that somebody is helping them improve those livelihoods, actually, you find that a number of them sort of subdue their worst instincts, right, in a number of ways. So I would say operating at massive scale in order to alleviate poverty, unfortunately, or fortunately so, governments are critical and indispensable because otherwise they will just kick you out, right? They will say, these are our people, and if you don't want to work with us, please leave, right? So it's, it's not a zero-sum game. I think it's a, it's a bit of, um, um, it's a complex world, right? So I think operating at scale then also necessarily needs the actors to also take a more nuanced approach in the way that they that they, did, that they deliver interventions. Sure. Yeah. It is 6 o'clock, so I think yes. we're about out of time. If I could ask you one more quick question, and if it's not a quick answer, you can feel free to skip it. Um, but if you, if you get a million dollars, you can obviously give $1,000 to 1,000 people, or 100 to 10,000, or, or any other distribution. How does Give Directly find the sweet spot that's best? Ah, research. Right? So I think th there is an amount of money for specifically, it depends on the intervention we are doing, right? If it's crisis response, right, where we are saying somebody does not have food, the goal of this program is some for somebody to get food over X period of time because they are, they've experienced a shock, mm -hmm. then I think um, smaller transfers make sense because that is the goal. But I would say if it's poverty alleviation, there is research we did in Kenya that actually gave us the sweet spot that it's that um, anywhere above $750, that is when you can begin having the, the impact that lasts 10 years. Mm. Um, yeah. Very cool. Thank you very much, audience, for all the, the amazing questions. We really appreciate them. Again, come work with us, donate to us, and uh, challenge us uh, as much as you can, either online or on, in other forums, so that we continue, I think, becoming an even better, effective, but also scalable organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael.